What if the Lord of Lizard Eaters was not even what we thought it was? Imagine the surprise when recent analysis revealed a fundamental twist. The very fossils that once defined Saurophaganax may actually belong to a newly identified species of Allosaurus, along with some bones from sauropod dinosaurs. This potential reclassification shatters the long-held image of Saurophaganax as a distinct genus one of the Jurassic's top standalone predators. Today, we'll trace its rise to fame, the fierce debate over its true identity, and the striking new study that upends what we thought we knew about this Jurassic giant, proving that even the most famous ancient names aren't set in stone. Imagine a predator standing as tall as a modern giraffe and stretching longer than a bus. This was Saurophaganax, a theropod dinosaur estimated to measure between 33 and 43 feet long, large enough to rival almost any land predator of its time. Living during the late Jurassic period, roughly 150 million years ago, this behemoth would have reigned in an era teeming with giants. Its name translating to Lord of Lizard Eaters paints a vivid picture of its dominance in an ecosystem where survival often depended on size, power and precision. The story of Saurophaganax begins with its fossils unearthed from the Morrison Formation, one of the richest sources of Jurassic dinosaur remains in the world. Spanning much of Western North America, this ancient floodplain was home to a dynamic ecosystem filled with towering sauropods like Diplodocus and Brachiosaurus, as well as smaller predators and plant eaters. In this environment, Saurophaganax may have held a critical role at the top of the food chain, scavenging or hunting the massive herbivores that shared its domain. The initial discovery of its fossils in Oklahoma in the 1930s sparked significant interest in the paleontological community. Here was an animal that, while clearly similar to Allosaurus, displayed features that made it stand apart. Among these differences were subtle but distinct variations in its skeletal structure. For instance, the neural arches of the vertebrae showed proportions and shapes not typically found in Allosaurus specimens. Additionally, its sheer size was unusual. While large Allosaurus individuals could reach about 30 feet long, Saurophaganax exceeded this comfortably. These details led some paleontologists to suggest a new genus entirely, one that reflected its monstrous scale and hinted at possible ecological differences between it and its smaller relatives. In this light, Saurophaganax became more than just another predator. It was potentially a separate lineage of giant theropod specialized to thrive in the unique conditions of late Jurassic North America. The Morrison Formation itself was a spectacle of extremes. Imagine an endless stretch of conifer forests, fern prairies and meandering rivers crisscrossing the land. Within this ancient wilderness, Saurophaganax might have loomed as an apex predator standing in competition with other carnivores, including smaller Allosaurus individuals, Ceratosaurus and the sharp-toothed Torvosaurus. The environment wasn't just vast, it was dangerous. Prey species like Apatosaurus uh, and Camarasaurus would have required both strategy and brute force to bring down, making it likely that Saurophaganax relied on a combination of teamwork and scavenging to secure meals. Its impact within this ecosystem can only be guessed, but its size and predatory design suggest an animal no rival could easily ignore. Its name, Lord of Lizard Eaters, further elevated its mystique capturing imaginations both within science and in popular culture. For decades, the name Saurophaganax evoked images of a near mythical creature, one worthy of its title. However, not everyone agreed that the fossils justified this grandeur. Even in the 20th century, debates arose over whether the anatomical differences were truly enough to distinguish Saurophaganax as a genus of its own or if it was simply a very large Allosaurus specimen. Some argued that intraspecific variation, the natural differences seen within members of the same species, could explain the distinct features of Saurophaganax fossils. Others pointed out the fragmentary nature of the remains, noting that without a complete skeleton, it's difficult to make definitive claims. Despite these challenges, the allure of Saurophaganax persisted. 
Its incomplete skeleton became as much a mystery as it was a discovery, giving it an almost legendary quality among paleontologists. This was no ordinary theropod, whether it represented a unique genus or not. It symbolized the incredible biodiversity and complexity of the Jurassic world. As new analysis and techniques became available, the question remained, would these enigmatic fossils reveal more about Saurophaganax's place in history? or would they ultimately fall back into the shadow of Allosaurus? But labeling it a separate genus required strong evidence. What might initially seem like major differences could under scrutiny prove less convincing, which raises the question, were these scattered fossils really enough to warrant an entirely new genus, or was there more to the story? What happens when the evidence for a new species doesn't quite add up? That's the challenge paleontologists have faced for decades with Saurophaganax. At the heart of the mystery lies a simple yet heated question. Was this towering predator a unique genus or just an oversized Allosaurus? When Saurophaganax was first described, researchers noted several distinct features in its fossils that hinted at something more than just a particularly large specimen of Allosaurus. For example, it had neural arches with unusual proportions and patterns not typically seen in known Allosaurus fossils. The meat chopper chevrons in its tail added to its perceived uniqueness, showcasing broad and hefty structures that gave the dinosaur its imposing stature. These differences were key in proposing that Saurophaganax deserved its own genus, at least according to early proponents of the idea. Classifying dinosaurs, however, doesn't rest solely on visual differences. Paleontologists rely on a detailed process called cladistic analysis. This involves comparing individual anatomical features across many related species to discern evolutionary relationships. Each detail, like the size of a vertebra or the angle of a joint, is coded into a, a data matrix and analyzed to piece together the most likely family tree. The goal is to identify traits specific to one group known as synapomorphies that could justify Saurophaganax's independence from Allosaurus. However, not all scientists agreed that these traits were exclusive to Saurophaganax. For some, the apparent differences simply weren't significant enough to separate it from its more famous cousin. Critics instead suggested that the outlined features exemplified intraspecific variation, the natural range of differences found within individuals of the same species. After all, modern animals like crocodiles vary considerably in size and proportions depending on factors like age, sex or environmental conditions. If the same idea applied to dinosaurs, then perhaps the so-called unique characteristics of Saurophaganax were just exaggerations of traits already present in large Allosaurus individuals. At the centre of the debate was the fossil evidence, most notably the holotype neural arch known as OMNH 1123. This fragment, along with other fossil pieces found in Oklahoma, showcased intriguing qualities, but they were far from a complete skeleton. Fragmentary fossils like these create inherent challenges in classification. Without a fuller picture of the animal's anatomy, any perceived uniqueness could either be confirmed or entirely overturned. The problem of fragmentary fossils isn't unique to Saurophaganax. Dinosaurs like Epantherias have sparked similar disagreements. Originally considered a distinct genus, Epantherius was later reclassified as a large individual of Allosaurus after further study. Elsewhere, debates around species like Chilosaurus illustrate how differing interpretations of limited evidence can yield wildly different conclusions. One researcher's unique dinosaur can quickly become another's junior synonym, showing just how subjective the process of classification can be when reliant on incomplete material. In Saurophaganax's case, preservation also played a role in limiting the available data. Some of the fossils were poorly preserved, likely due to the excavation methods used by workers during the Great Depression, which further complicated efforts to draw definitive conclusions. As new techniques and fresh perspectives entered the field, doubts grew. Over time, many paleontologists came to favor a more conservative view. Rather than creating an entirely new genus, they began to interpret Saurophaganax as a very large example of Allosaurus, 
possibly an extreme individual or a regional variant. Ultimately, this interpretation gained traction and Sorophaganax was often relegated to the status of a junior synonym of Allosaurus. Still, the question of genus versus species wasn't the end of the story. Could new evidence, re-examined fossils or cutting-edge studies shed any light on what Sorophaganax truly was or could the very identity of this dinosaur take an entirely unexpected turn? What if the fossils of Sorophaganax weren't even what we thought they were? This question was at the center of a groundbreaking re-evaluation led by paleontologist Andy Dannison and colleagues. Their study fundamentally challenged the identity of Sorophaganax as a distinct genus calling into question decades of assumptions. At the heart of their research was the holotype neural arch, a key fossil upon which much of Sorophaganax's classification had been based. By analyzing this fragment with modern techniques, the researchers made a striking discovery. Features of the neural arch, specifically its accessory laminae, were more consistent with juvenile sauropods like Apatosaurus than with theropod predators. This realization cast serious doubt on Sorophaganax's status as a theropod at all, let alone a new genus. Some of the other bones historically associated with Sorophaganax added to the confusion. Several were revealed to belong to diplodocid sauropods, herbivorous dinosaurs that roamed the same Jurassic floodplains. As it turns out, fossils from the Kenton, one quarry where these remains originated, had been a mix of species all along, largely due to the conditions under which they were collected. Excavations in the mid 20th century lacked the precise documentation methods modern paleontology now relies upon leaving researchers today with the challenge of untangling these misattributions. Dannison's team took full advantage of advances in paleohistology, a technique that allows scientists to analyze microscopic bone structures to clarify which fossils belonged to which animals. This method gave them a window into the biological identity of bones that for decades had been grouped under the Sorophaganax label. The reanalysis didn't just rule out certain fossils, it also led to the recognition of a new species entirely. Dannison and his team identified subtle but key differences in some Allosaurus fossils from the same site that had long been lumped in with Sorophaganax. These differences included features like the cranial ornamentation found on the post-orbital bone, which was notably lacking in these specimens compared to the more familiar Allosaurus fragilis. Another distinguishing trait was the unique structure of the chevron's bones located in the tail that were unlike those seen in other Allosaurus species. Based on this evidence, the team proposed the name Allosaurus anax, meaning different lizard lord, as a nod to the species' distinct anatomy and its connection to the Sorophaganax debate. For some, the conclusions of this study were bittersweet. Dinosaur enthusiasts who had admired the name Lord of Lizard Eaters were dismayed to see it fade into obscurity, replaced with the more technical Allosaurus Anax and the classification of Sorophaganax as a nomen dubium, a name of doubtful validity. Others, however, celebrated the findings as a step forward for dinosaur science. The study underscored how much more there is to learn from fossils sitting in museum collections, even those that have been studied for decades. It also highlighted the complexities of dinosaur ecosystems in the late Jurassic. The discovery of Allosaurus anax added to a growing picture of diversity among predatory theropods in the Morrison Formation, raising new questions about how these dinosaurs divided their ecological roles. The process behind these discoveries was anything but simple. Researchers spent countless hours re-examining fossils, not just from Oklahoma, but from other North American sites as well. Each fragment demanded careful inspection, whether with microscopes or comparative charts displaying every known Allosaurus feature. These efforts reveal just how painstaking and uncertain the work of paleontology can be. Errors in the historical record aren't rare, and the Sorophaganax case shows how easily fossils from entirely different species can be conflated in rich, but chaotic sites like the Kenton One Quarry. 
the mixed reactions among the paleontological community and wider public reflect the balance between nostalgia and scientific progress. Names like Sorophaganax carry cultural weight, inspiring wonder far beyond the academic world. Its reclassification, while a loss to its mystique, reminds us that science is about following the evidence. Such studies help refine our understanding, not just of individual species, but of the entire ecosystems they were part of. What does Sorophaganax's story tell us? For one, it's a reminder that dinosaur categorization isn't set in stone. It is an evolving puzzle, one piece of Jurassic history at a time. The journey of Sorophaganax highlights just how much our understanding of the ancient world can shift. First considered a new giant predator, then thought to be just a very large Allosaurus, and finally redefined as Allosaurus, Anax, its story reflects the evolving, uncertain nature of paleontology. Each stage from initial discovery to synonymization and then to the recognition of a new species demonstrates how museum collections and careful reanalysis can overturn decades of assumptions about individual dinosaurs and their place in the family tree. This case also points to the ongoing potential within the Morrison Formation, where many fossils remain unstudied, often misclassified in collections. With more material still waiting in museum drawers and quarry sites, it's likely that other giant dinosaurs are yet to be fully recognized, promising new insights into the incredible complexity and diversity of the late Jurassic world.